going to be talking about chapters two and three of Capital, uh, which is on the question of money, which is uh, often today, it's the most kind of mystified, the most fetishized part of the economy. Um, but, and the first thing that strikes you about these two chapters is how Marx deals with money. He deals with it in a very uh, historical, social, dynamic way. He doesn't see it as something imposed on society by bankers, but as something that flows directly from the development of society, the development of the economy, the development of capitalism in particular. And uh, we, should, we can contrast this actually today, for those who are familiar with Bitcoin, we can contrast it with the approach of people uh, who, who put forward Bitcoin as an alternative currency, who, who model it entirely separate to a real economy and they attempt to impose their, their perfect mathematical model onto uh, commodity production and exchange, which is not how uh, money initially developed. And you can really see that uh, in chapters two and three of Capital. So in this historical development, Marx traces it and he says, as the forces of economic production develop, uh, you begin to see, well, as forces of economic production develop, commodity exchange itself develops. More and more things are being produced, far more than individuals need to consume just for themselves. And so they start to trade them and commodity exchange then uh, develops. And the more that commodity exchange develops, the more necessary it becomes to have one particular commodity which can measure the value of all other commodities, a universal equivalent or a universal measure of value, as Marx calls it. Because uh, as building on some of the stuff that James was just talking about, within commodity exchange, you begin to see the separation of use values and exchange values. For a commodity producer, for a capitalist, say a capitalist produces uh, 100 tables, those 100 tables, apart from possibly one, so at least 99 of those tables are not useful to that capitalist. He might want to keep one for himself. But the rest of them are not useful. They have no use value to him. They, uh, they only really, for him, have an exchange value. That's, that is their use value, if you like. And, uh, and so you begin, as commodity exchange develops, you see this separation between use value and exchange value, and that reaches its highest point with money. Because uh, you can have as much money as you want, you can have as many gold coins as you want, but they are not actually useful to you in any way. You can't eat them, they can't keep you warm or anything else. They're useful only in that they can be exchanged. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, you see here then, as well as being a universal equivalent, a universal means of exchange, you see the other kind of side of money, the other important function of money that Marx deals with, which is that it is a means of exchange. On the one hand, it's a store of value, a, a universal measure of all the value in all the other commodities. And on the other side, it's a means of exchange. It's a means of exchanging all the other commodities with each other. It's obviously a much more efficient way uh, of exchange than, for example, barter, where you would have to find the person who had the exact thing that you want and you have the exact thing that they want and you can swap it. As long as you've got a, a universal equivalent, that functions very well as a means of exchange. And when, uh, when you understand this, when you understand the, the two sides of, uh, of money, the two, the two roles, the two functions that it plays, you can see why ultimately people settled on precious, society settled on precious metals as uh, the, the commodity by which, it, within which, uh, or against which, all other commodities are measured. Marx says in, uh, in chapter two, he says it was kind of accidental what function does the universal equivalent at first. Uh, and actually, very early on, it was, it was slaves. It was, it was the human form, actually, that was, that was used as a universal equivalent. This particular thing is worth this number of slaves. And various societies throughout history, throughout prehistory, have used different things. Shells, cattle, beads, like all sorts of things. But ultimately, all societies have tended towards using precious metals, in particular, obviously, gold. Um, and this is, uh, this, we can understand this if we understand those two functions of money, because on the one hand, uh, and this is the most important aspect of precious metals, they concentrate a lot of value in a small amount of, of physical material. Right? Going back to what James was talking about just now, about the definition of value as socially necessary human labor time, uh, human labor power required to produce it. To produce gold takes a lot of effort, basically. It takes a lot of effort to, to find where it is in the ground, to dig it up, to do whatever process they have to do to get it out of the, out of the earth and, and into a kind of bar or, or coin format. It takes a lot of socially necessary human labor uh, power to go into that. And that means that a lot of value is concentrated in a relatively small uh, amount of stuff, which is not the case with, uh, with, with other things. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but on top of that, um, not only does it concentrate a lot of value in a small... Um, in a small, in a small amount of uh, physical material, and therefore is a good universal equivalent. It's also a good means of exchange. 
because uh, it is uh, it, because of its physical properties. It's durable. It's inert. It won't it won't react with the air or, or water or something and disintegrate. Uh, and uh, and it's easily divisible. And also you can divide it down into coins, or you can melt it all together and build it up into bigger blocks. And all of these things make it very useful. Its physical properties make it very good means of exchange, basically a way of, uh, of, of trading other commodities with each other. So these two things together explain why money has always tended, or societies have always tended to using uh, precious metals as money, as the universal equivalent, as the thing by which you measure all other values. Now, um, <clears throat> As commodity exchange develops, and this is going back to what the first point I made um, about, uh, about Marx dealing with the question of money in a kind of historical dynamic social way, he goes on to say, look, as, uh, as commodity exchange uh, develops, you begin to see um, the kind of the demand for the, for the means of exchange outstrip the supply of the universal equivalent, if you see what I mean. More transactions are taking place than can be covered by the amount of gold or whatever precious metal we're talking about, but we'll say gold. Marx talks about gold in the book, so I'm going to talk about gold. Then can be covered by the amount of gold that there is in, uh, in society. And this can be a problem for the development of the economy, because obviously it's transactions, it's commodity exchange that causes more and more to be produced, and that's what causes the economy to develop. But if that's being held back by the, by the physical supply of, uh, of gold or the, or the ability to move it or whatever else, then, uh, then the development of the economy has a bit of a problem. And so Marx points out that um, there's a kind of pressure, there's a tendency towards a divorce of these two functions of money, the universal equivalent on the one hand and uh, the means of exchange on the other, to allow for more transactions. And so what you see, Marx says, is the use of tokens to represent the value that is contained within the universal equivalent, within the commodity that's being within the gold, tokens to represent that value, which become the means of exchange instead. And that's what you see now with your, with your, with your £10 note in your pocket. It says, I, I, uh, I promise to pay the bearer on demand £10. Right? It's a token. It's a representation of £10. It's not actually £10. That piece of paper, while it does have some value, some human labour time has gone into producing that, it's not nearly as much as the £10 that it actually represents. It's, a, it's just a token to facilitate uh, more rapid and easier exchange uh, of commodities. And of course, going beyond paper, Marx actually talks about Potentially, he says we could just use paper paper tokens for these sorts of things. He says that in Capital, and of course today we see electronic signals used for that. Like just bank transfers are just tokens. Like they don't actually represent. They don't have any value themselves. Now, um, obviously, when you get to this uh, kind of situation, are you going to give me notes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. I was just got self-conscious. Um, uh, yeah. When when you when you get to this kind of stage where you're using tokens instead of the actual uh, commodity like gold. Um, you don't actually need that gold in your possession to be able to, to affect uh, transactions. And actually, as a society, there is no limit then, theoretically, or you would think, there's no limit to how much money you could shovel into the system. Because you, you don't actually need the gold. You need something far less costly to produce, such as a bit of paper or some electronic signals. You could actually just funnel as much uh, money into the system as you wanted. But of course, we should remember here, going, right, going back to the beginning of what I was saying, like, Money is a measure of value. It's not completely arbitrary how much money there is in society. How much money there is in society is linked to, co to the concrete, to the real economy. It's linked, on the one hand, uh, to the value of all the commodities in circulation, and on the other hand, to the, the speed with which those commodities are circulated. If there's more transactions, you need more money. Uh, and if there's fewer transactions, you need less money, and if there's more commodities, you need more money to represent those commodities, and if there's fewer commodities, less money. But the money is actually linked to this, so it's not entirely uh, arbitrary, and that means you can't just funnel endless amounts of uh, paper tokens to represent more money than there actually is, because that money has to be linked uh, more or less to the uh, real economy. And this actually, by the way, um, I, I didn't explain what Bitcoin is because I don't really have time to, so if you're not familiar with it, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but I'm just going to reference it again. Um, Bitcoin sort of overlooks this, actually. It's an interesting feature of Bitcoin that they have set an uh, essentially arbitrary, the developers of Bitcoin set an arbitrary uh, number of Bitcoins that will be produced ever in, in, in all of history, which will be reached in... I actually can't remember the date, it's like 2022 or something. And, uh, and, and once they're all produced, that's it, there's no more. It's an entirely arbitrary amount of coinage that's going into the, into the system, which again is not how 
Uh, it's not how money works, basically. It's not how, how commodity exchange requires money uh, to work. Um, and the reason, of course, for this is, is, as I sort of mentioned earlier when I referenced Bitcoin, it's not, it's not linked to the economy. You can't actually buy that much stuff with Bitcoin. It doesn't have, it's not, it doesn't really function, as it certainly doesn't function as a universal equivalent. It barely functions as an equivalent for anything, actually, uh, at the moment. And so it's not really linked to a real economy. And so they just set this arbitrary amount of coins that we're going to take. It's nothing to, it's kind of backwards to how real money actually developed uh, in its kind of historical and social uh, context. Although uh, money, of course, is actually fixed to the economy, the development of commodity exchange and more and more transactions taking place in this sort of thing puts a certain <coughs> pressure to relax the rigidity with which it is tied to the real economy. And, uh, and so you saw in, in the, kind of the pre-World War I days in Britain, for example, that uh, that currency, that money, was pegged to the value of gold. It, there was a, they called it a gold standard. And the value of gold determined the value of money directly. It was a direct link to, uh, to a real physical thing that was produced uh, in the economy. And that worked quite well because gold, obviously, there was, for most of history, there's been a fairly um, stable amount of gold circulating. And so if the go amount of gold in society is more or less the same or increasing very slowly or whatever, then you're not going to see a, a vast... Uh, change in the actual value of money and then you won't see lots of changes in price and this sort of thing So it helps helps a lot to have a kind of gold standard to keep money about the same uh, value all the time um, But as uh, as commodity exchange uh, Develops and more and more transactions are taking place There is this pressure to kind of relax the strictness with which money is anchored to uh, a real commodity like gold and actually in the 1890s in the US, you had this, this, a movement called the populist movement. And they were, one of their main planks was bimetallism. They said what we want is currency that is tied, that mon money that is tied, pegged not just to gold, but also to silver in a ratio of one to 15 or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so it's pegged to two different things, uh, which would represent a certain relaxation of the, of, of the commodity to which, of, of the value of, uh, of money, if you like, the commodity to which it's pinned. And actually, interestingly enough, as a, as a brief um, side note, this, the story of the Wizard of Oz is actually, it references this debate, this argument that was going on in the United States at that time. The Yellow Brick Road, well, Dorothy's slippers, not in the film, but in the original book, were, were made of silver. And, and the silver slippers will carry you along the Yellow Brick Road to home. It was the interplay of silver and gold. That was what the book, one of the points of the book was actually about. Um, and it's a reflection of this argument that's going on at the time. Although in chapter three of Capital, there's an interesting footnote uh, where Marx actually takes on this question of bimetallism directly and says it, it doesn't work because at the end of the day, um, the, the gold and silver are themselves commodities and therefore they can, their, their value can fluctuate. Uh, and if one fluctuates more than the other, if the, if, the if the value of silver changes because there's some development in the smelting, in the method of smelting silver or whatever, which brings down the socially necessary labor time that goes into the production of silver, then the value of silver changes, but the value of gold doesn't change. But if you've pegged, if you pegged to both commodities at a ratio of one to 15, then everything, the currency is, gonna, is, is, is not gonna work properly, basically. Marx takes this on in uh, Capital. But, uh, but then, you, in particular, you saw uh, in Britain, for example, uh, Britain came off the gold standard. It, it decoupled its currency uh, from uh, gold uh, during the First World War, because that was the time of uh, a lot of, they needed to print a lot of money. They needed a lot more money in circulation. They needed to be a lot more, lot more flexible to pay for the war. Uh, and they had, they were forced, the capitalist class was forced to relax uh, the rules in relation to, to, uh, to, to money. Um, <clears throat> but then once things had calmed down a bit, once there was a little bit more stability, they felt able, after the Second World War, to, to reintroduce a peg. It was not quite as strict as the gold standard, but you had the Bretton Woods Agreement, which was basically an agreement set up by the United States to peg all the currencies in the world, or a lot of currencies in the world, to the US dollar. Which, and because the US controlled two thirds or something of the world's gold at that time in Fort Knox, they, um, they, their, their currency was in effect as good as gold. It was slightly more relaxed, it wasn't directly pegged to gold, it was pegged to the dollar. But nevertheless, uh, they did it. And they were able to do that because it was a time of more stability. It was the post war boom. Uh, there was a more stable global economic situation. And so uh, they could tighten up again the, 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 the money. The, the link between money and the real economy, because the real economy was actually doing quite well. 
Um, but of course that all changed when the Bretton Woods Agreement collapsed in the 1970s. Um, and, they, and that was a, a product of capitalist crisis. Once, uh, once the real economy started going badly, they had to decouple the currencies from the real economy to try and just keep the currencies, try and, try and do their best to keep the currencies uh, afloat. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and since then, you've had currencies floating against each other. Um, because currencies, uh, if, if, they don't, if they have a fixed exchange rate, if, if the pound is always fixed to gold or to the dollar or something else, then you can't, the, the British capitalists cannot devalue their currencies. In a period of crisis, they need to devalue, they need to make the pound less valuable. So that then, commodities that you're exporting, commodities that the British capitalists are exporting, are cheaper because they're denominated in pounds, so people have to pay less effectively in their home currency because the pound is cheaper. So if you're converting dollars to pounds and pounds are, really, pounds are worth nothing, then it's much cheaper to buy British exports. So in a period of crisis, it's very important for the capitalist class in each individual country to be able to, to devalue or change the value of their currency. And, and so you get this enormous pressure every time there's crisis, you get this pressure to loosen the link between um, between, uh, between the currency, between money and, uh, and the real economy. Um, <clears throat> and of course you've seen that in particular today as well. One thing that could not have been done with the Bretton Woods Agreement or with the gold standard is the policy of quantitative easing, which has been pursued by, um, by the European Central Bank, by the Federal Reserve in the United States. And that is effectively a policy Everyone always describes it, and this is correct, this is the correct way to do it, it's effectively printing money. The central bank uses its own money, or, or, or money that it sort of creates, to buy bonds that banks sell, to basically pay money to banks. Uh, and then, and then it, the purpose being to inject more money into the economy. It is effectively then just injecting this money out of nowhere uh, into the economy. And, uh, and that's, not the, that, that's not the sort of thing that you can do if your currency is pegged to, um, uh, something, pegged to gold or something like this in a very rigid uh, way. Now, um, <clears throat> that, was a very, that was an extremely potted history of like, the development of the link between um, like money and, uh, and the real economy. But the point is that there is a development, that's the crucial point here, that there is a development in this direction, this pressure towards loosening the link between uh, money and, uh, and, and the economy, uh, which is nevertheless still there, it has to be anchored there in some way. But this loosening, uh, this loosening has to take place in order to smooth over the effects of capitalist crisis. Every time capitalism goes into crisis, there's more and more pressure to do this so that the bosses, so that the capitalists can keep their profits turning over through all sorts of financial wizardry, default credit swaps and, uh, and all this kind of thing, but nevertheless keep the, keep the overall, the top line profit figures uh, healthy. And this is an answer. There are people today who point, they point to a lot of the problems, the financialization of the economy and, uh, and quantitative easing, and they say this, this is causing problems because you're effectively injecting lots of money into the system. It's, it is causing inflation, no doubt about that, but it's not, that money is not filtering down into the real economy. That money is staying with the banks who, spe who use it to speculate on, uh, on stocks and shares, basically, or development in, uh, in countries like India and this sort of thing. They speculate on those things, and, uh, and the, the, it causes bubbles, basically speculative bubbles, which is why Bitcoin is so valuable. It's, it's a, it's a, or Bitcoin's price is so high, rather, it's not actually very valuable. Um, <clears throat> But it's because it's a speculative bubble. And they point to, certain economists point to all these things, and they say this is a big problem, and therefore what we need is to return to the gold standard. Because if we had the gold standard, you wouldn't be able to do these things. It would tighten monetary policy. It would rein in all of this stuff that's going on with money. And, uh, and it would stop all these kind of problems. Now, uh, that is a completely, in my opinion, utopian, ahistorical view of the development of money. It doesn't understand how capitalism has developed to this point. This isn't an aberration. The financialization of the economy and, and, uh, and, and money dominating in the way that it does is not an aberration. It's not a mistake of, of capitalist development. It's the inevitable process of capitalist development. It's the, inevitable end, it's the inevitable end point of a capitalist system which inevitably goes into crisis. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, another point about this, this general development, the use of uh, tokens to, to represent as, as, as money, basically, is that you begin to, you begin to see from, from a very uh, early stage, money, uh, being, you're not, money basically being a promise 
to pay. You're not actually paying for something when, when you hand over a £10 note, you're promising to pay. When you make a bank transfer, when you look at your bank account and you see that you've got how much money you've got in there, you don't actually have that. You don't have it sitting on the table in front of you. That is a promise. That is the bank promising to pay you that money. You don't actually have that in front of you. And, uh, and <clears throat> when you get to this sort of situation, you basically see what, what Marx talks about. He says it's a, a, this kind of disconnect between buying and selling. And, uh, and that allows, this promising to pay, allows for the develop. that's the basis for credit. And that's the basis for hoarding, and therefore speculation and lending and this sort of stuff. And this, uh, this ultimately is what allows capitalism, and this was dealt with very briefly in the last session, but it's what allows capitalism to develop beyond its limits, beyond the limits of what the, the capitalist market really actually would allow. Because you can lend people money, you can keep promising, yeah, I will, I will pay for that, I will pay for that. Uh, no problem about that. And, uh, and it allows then more commodities to be produced, more transactions to take place, all on the basis of promises to pay, which are embodied in these tokens, but not actual payment, not actual transfer of the real uh, universal equivalent. Um, <clears throat> and of course, then when capitalism does eventually go into crisis, when the crisis of, of, of overproduction, which will be dealt with later, but when capitalist crisis rears its head, um, everybody suddenly tries to call back all their debts. Everybody, basically, you're stretching a, an elastic band further and further and further with this credit, these promises to pay, but obviously you can only stretch so far, and at a certain point, it snaps back. And everybody suddenly calls in all their debts and tries to recoup all the money that they have been, or tries to get back all the money that they've been promised. And of course, inevitably, lots of people can't pay. This is actually what that it was mentioned earlier, the centre page of the Socialist Appeal about the financial crash 10 years ago. That's basically what happened then, and the centre pages deal with this point. That that, it didn't cause uh, the crisis, the, 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 some of the bourgeois economists say that it was a lack of credit, a drying up of credit, that caused the crisis. And that was a symptom of the crisis, and it made the crisis a lot worse. It exacerbated the crisis a lot, but it didn't actually cause it in the first place. Capitalism goes into crisis for other reasons, which will be dealt with uh, later on. But, uh, but credit and this... Um, <clears throat> The, basically the functioning of money in, capital, in, in this period of capitalism uh, made that crisis uh, a lot worse than, um, than it might otherwise have been. But that, again, is not an aberration. It's not, it's not capitalism gone wrong. It's the inevitable end point of the development of, uh, of capitalism and, and its use of money and so on. Now, um, <clears throat> finally then, the main point that I think we can take out of chapters two and three is that, that money is a product of commodity exchange. That as society developed a uh, system of commodity exchange, um, money was, was the outcome of that. Ma Marx uses the phrase that commodity exchange sweats money from every pore. It's not the other way around. It's not like a monetary system was just imposed. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so for that reason, again, to come back to Bitcoin, you can see I've got a bee in my bonnet about this. Um, <clears throat> that uh, the enthusiasts of Bitcoin, or the, the developers of it, they correctly identify some of the problems with uh, with, with kind of money and in, in, in capitalism today. Um, but, the, uh, but they attribute those to, to bad policy by central banks, over-centralization of, uh, of, of uh, the monetary supply and monetary control and so on. And, uh, and what they say is that if you distribute the means of the production of money amongst lots of different people, then you'll solve that problem. Don't rely on central banks, rely on just this whole, uh, this big network of people who are producing uh, bitcoins. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but in reality, if we understand that money is a product of commodity exchange, then how you produce money is not the key question. The key question is the question of exchange. It's the question of who is producing the commodities and who owns the means of production of commodities, who owns the means of production in society. That's the point. If money is a product of commodity exchange, which Marx argues that it is, then, uh, then it's not a matter of, of distributing the means of production of money and leaving everything else in private hands. It's a matter, instead, of, of, of taking the means of production of wealth as a whole into public ownership, socialising that, and then you get around the problem of uh, over-centralization in the hands of people who are only interested in making profit at the expense of everybody else. And of course, then, that also this point about money being a product of commodity exchange also raises the point about what money would look like under socialism. If we do have a system where we're no longer producing for exchange to make a profit, we no longer have commodity exchange, but where everyone is, uh, is producing and consuming from this kind of collective pool of... Uh, of, of of commodity or of, of things that, that we need to live, then, uh, then you would see money 
at least first of all, at least fundamentally change its function. Uh, and, uh, and, and actually you begin to see, you would see, you would see it's kind of the token side of money being used, but it would be tokens giving you entitlement to goods from a collective pool of, uh, of what's being produced rather than uh, as, as a measure of the labor time contained in each, uh, in each commodity. And, uh, and actually, in my opinion, ultimately, and Trotsky says this, he says, money would never be abolished. Socialists and communists, they wouldn't abolish money. You don't need to abolish money. What you need to do is basically abolish commodity exchange by socializing the means of production. And when you do that, gradually, money will begin uh, to wither away. And that really then uh, is the future. Money will, be, will effectively be, be a, a story that we tell our grandchildren. Mm -hmm.